OK, so uh, federated learning is used to train machine learning models, where data stays with the clients, and the data is highly distributed. However, prior works have pointed out that gradients reveal sensitive data sets when clients send the gradients to the server. And on top of that, malicious clients can send malformed gradients, which degrade training accuracy. Both of these problems have been addressed by prior works on secure aggregation protocols for federated learning. Uh, however, irrespective of whether they use one server or whether they use distributed trust as a server for aggregation, they incur high client communication. And on top of that, uh, they also have high latency. And this is the problem that we set out to solve in this work. How do we achieve, uh, how do we solve both the problems with federated learning while also being concretely efficient? And since I'm standing here presenting this work, we solved the problem. We propose a new secure aggregation protocol which uses distributed trust at the servers. We address both the issues with federated learning, so the privacy issue and the issue of malformed gradients, while being concretely efficient. In particular, we have low client communication, and we also improve latency over prior work. So uh, let me start by talking a little bit more about a prior work on distributed trust and how they uh, function at a high level. So uh, uh, the general template for these works is that the client secret shares its gradients to the two servers and then provides proofs on top of those gradients, uh, uh, attesting to the fact that the gradients are well formed. And like I said, they have high client communication. Now, there's another line of work, uh, which, which is more recent, uh, which takes a very different approach to solve a similar problem. In, in this work, uh, clients don't send proofs to the servers. Rather, they just secret share their gradients to the servers and then leave the rest for the servers to decide. So the servers engage in a two-PC protocol, and they make sure that, yeah, the gradients are well formed. Now, this approach has uh, certain advantages over the approach, approaches on the left. It has low client communication and often has better latency uh, than uh, the proof-based approaches. However, it has one big problem. The problem is that you don't have any privacy if one of the two servers is malicious, which is why this is not a complete solution at all for the federated learning problem. Uh, in fact, just to... Uh, 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 say the same thing in different words. I initially pointed out two problems with federated learning, a privacy problem and a problem of malformed gradients, and this work does not solve one of those problems. So in our work, we actually want to work in the setting on the right, because it has great efficiency benefits, but uh, before we can use it, we need to solve this big problem. We need to solve this privacy problem with this work. So uh, let's start with that. So for the next couple of slides, we will be, we will be focusing on this problem uh, of providing privacy even if a server is malicious. And I'll uh, start introducing pictures in my slides now. So uh, we have a, a lot of client devices. We have two servers on the left. One of them can be malicious. Uh, and each client, uh, like I said, secret shares its gradients to the two servers. And then the two servers run a two PC protocol between them to make sure the gradients are well formed. So uh, a natural approach uh, that a lot of you might already be thinking about is why not add end-to-end -end malicious security in this protocol, and that would imply malicious privacy. That is correct. You can do that. Uh, let's see how that pans out. Uh, I, will, I will call that attempt one at achieving uh, this privacy goal that we have. So uh, what do we do uh, with that? So for the first thing we need to do is we need to change the 2PC protocol that runs between the servers to a malicious secure 2PC protocol. Earlier, it was a semi-honest protocol. And as soon as we do that, uh, we also need to change the way clients secret share their inputs. Clients now need to authenticate their inputs to the servers so that authenticated inputs can be used in the malicious secure protocol. And the way that works is that there will be a MAC key. No one knows the MAC key, but each server has one share of the MAC key. And then the servers will uh, start uh, a three PC protocol with each client. Uh, and the output of that would be authenticated uh, shares of the client's uh, input. And this happens once with each client. And once they have the authenticated shares, they can do the two PC that I described in the previous slide. So uh, excellent. This solves the problem. We have malicious privacy. But uh, obviously, there are some caveats. This approach is not efficient at all. Uh, first of all, it has very high client communication. Clients are interactive. They need to be online until the 3PC uh, protocol finishes. And on top of that, the entire protocol is just very, very slow. Uh, so you might be wondering, how do we uh, make this better? One of the avenues uh, of improvement 
is to not focus on end-to-end -end, uh, malicious security, but just focus on our original goal of achieving privacy. And uh, prior works, uh, which use uh, distributed proofs, like I mentioned before, also provide just privacy. They're not going for end-to-end -end malicious security just because you lose all the efficiency guarantees if you start chasing that uh, more difficult goal. So OK, so now we only care about privacy. Uh, the first thing that we observe as soon as we make that change is that uh, we can, we can take this original problem that we had, where there are many clients and two servers, and reduce this problem to a much simpler problem where there's just one client and the two servers. And if we can provide privacy for the setting on the right, then in our paper we show that you have privacy for the setting on the left. And the details for this reduction are rather more complex, so I'd refer you to the paper for that. But one thing that I should mention here is that such a reduction is only possible in our setting when you're considering malicious privacy and not end-to-end -end malicious security. OK, great. So we have this new insight. Uh, can we make our previous protocol any better uh, with this insight? The answer to that is yes, a little bit, but not so much. What we can improve is we can now make our clients non-interactive. Previously, they were interactive. And the way we would do that is that each client will now sample its own MAC key. It will use that to self-authenticate its inputs and then secret share it to the two servers uh, and they're on the two PC after that. So we have solved one of the problems, but the other two problems still remain. We have high client communication still, and on top of that, the two PC that runs between the servers, even if you plug the best state-of-the-art malicious secure two PC, you will be, you are looking at an overhead of more than 10x over the same UNS protocol. So even with our cool insight, we haven't really solved the problem. And the problem is still wide open. How do you achieve malicious privacy while also being concretely efficient? And uh, to this end, uh, we propose a new, pro new technique, and this is our main result in the paper. So we show how, in our setting, you can take a semi-honest protocol, and with almost no practical overhead, you can uh, uh, upgrade its uh, guarantees to, um, to malicious privacy. And in this process, the increase in client communication is negligible. It's just two lambda bits more uh, uh, communication for each client where lambda is the security parameter. So this result uh, seems uh, very interesting. Uh, let me now talk uh, at a high level how uh, it works. OK, so uh, this is the problem that we have. We have two servers. One of them can be malicious. And we want the honest server to be able to detect whenever the server on the top cheats. So, uh, our main insight in making this happen is uh, we realize that the two PC that happens between the servers is a two PC which uses inputs that the client already knows, right? It's, it's client's inputs. So if we somehow allow the client to look at the, ser look at the interactions between the servers, then this client can almost already detect a cheating server. And this is our uh, insight at a high level. And I'll be more concrete now. So let's say that uh, the two servers are running a semi-honest semi 2 PC, and we know that there's very efficient ways uh, to achieve semi-honest uh, 2 PC in this setting. And both the servers have their own random tapes, which are used in this protocol. And then we have the client on the right. Client has its input X, which it has already secret shared between the two servers, and the servers are running 2 PC on those shares. Now, what I'm about to say is actually the most important part of the talk, so please pay attention. Uh, in such a setting, if the random tapes of the two servers are given to the client, then something very interesting happens. But before I get into that, I want to clear your, uh, a doubt that, that, that some of you might be having, that is it OK to give the random tapes of the servers to the client? And the answer to that is, fortunately, yes. Because, uh, once you, because the random tapes just provide privacy uh, uh, of the client's secret when the servers talk to each other. And since it's the client's secret, it is OK to do that. OK, great. So we can give the client random tapes of the servers. And as soon as we do that, we have solved the malicious privacy problem. Why? Because the client can now emulate the entire interactions of the two servers uh, entirely in its own head without talking to anyone. And if it can do that, it can tell, to, tell both the servers that these are the messages that you should see from the other server. If you see any deviation in these messages, abort the protocol because my privacy is in danger. And so if the server on the top cheats, the server on the bottom sees a hash mismatch, and it's going to abort the protocol. Uh, so uh, 
This is how we solve the problem, and let me take a step back and recap what we've done so far. So we started off with this protocol, Prio Plus, which had good efficiency guarantees, but did not provide privacy for servers malicious, and we have fixed that problem while also, being, uh, while also preserving the efficiency guarantees that it had. And putting this into context to prior work, which also provides the same guarantees, we have solved both the efficiency problems that those works uh, incurred. So uh, for the next couple of minutes, uh, I wanted to talk about this trade-off that is at the core of our protocol. So our protocol has this client communication versus latency trade-off, and we want to dissect that a little more. What we, what we want to, uh, the question that we want to answer here is, can we uh, give up some of the client communication if we can make our protocol much faster? And uh, the, w the place where it shows up in our protocol is, uh, is the two PC that happens between the servers. For the two PC, the servers need a lot of correlated randomness, and if the servers generate it themselves, they incur a lot of communication and it's expensive for them. But the same job can be done by a client much more efficiently, in fact, locally, and then the client can just stream these to the servers as they do the two PC. And uh, a similar observation was made in the Prio paper as well. So if, if we do that, if we use clients to send this correlated randomness, obviously the client communication increases, but we reduce the latency of our protocol by a lot. In the paper, we also uh, talk about using pseudo-random correlation generators to actually bypass this trade-off, but I'll not go into, into the details for that. You can look at the paper. Now, one problem that shows up uh, if we actually use clients for correlated randomness is that clients in our protocol can be malicious, which means that whatever they're sending cannot actually be trusted at all. And uh, in our protocol, if we try to fix that, uh, unfortunately, we lose uh, non-interactivity at the clients. Which is, uh, which is yeah, not, not, not ideal, and the details why we, do, why we lose that are in the paper, but the good news is that we show how you can use a distributed variant of Yershimi to actually solve that problem as well. And again, the details in the paper. Okay, so moving on to the evaluation now. So uh, our, the, first eva the first comparison I want to make is with the two-server baseline for which we picked the Prio protocol. So here I am showing you client communication and latency as the two efficiency metrics. And I have two variants here for ELSA because we have a trade-off. We have the fastest variant, and, and then we have another variant which, in which you can squish down the communication of client by more than two orders of magnitude at just 50% increase in uh, latency. So that is very, very uh, fascinating when we first saw that. And both of these variants of ELSA are actually better than the prior work for both client communication and latency. Uh, then the second comparison I want to draw is uh, with a single server baseline for which we chose the Rofl protocol, which was presented yesterday at the symposium. And there again, we have a similar story, uh, although the increase in, uh, uh, in our second variant in latency is slightly higher, but it's, it's still pretty decent. And again, compared to Rofl, we, we see uh, huge gains, actually. Uh, although I should mention here that Rofl requires a single server, whereas we require two servers, so they, are not, uh, they don't rely on the non-collision assumption that we rely on. So keep that in the back of your head when you parse these results. So finally, I'd like to conclude. ELSA is a distributed trust-based FL protocol that achieves privacy if a server is malicious. It is resilient to malicious clients. And on the efficiency side, it has low lat latency and low client communication. Thank you so much for your time. So uh, I'm not sure if I followed you correctly. So you allow the client to decide which of the two servers is uh, malicious or not, right? Because uh, the client sends to each of the servers what should be the message to be exchanged between them when they run the uh, semi-honest uh, UPC communication, right? So what if this the client is compromised and just want to frame one of the servers? Oh, that's, that's a great question. So in our protocol, when the client tells each server this is the message that you should see from the servers, they are not saying that send this message to the other server. They are saying that whatever you get from the other server should match what I am telling. If it does not match, take me out of the protocol because I don't want to participate because there's something fishy going on. So you actually just use that as a double-checking mechanism to make sure that uh, not bad messages are being exchanged between two servers. So the client doesn't get to decide which of the two servers is malicious. Neither does the client get to decide what message the server should exchange between each other, uh, if, if that answers your question. But, 
But the problem is that whatever the client tells that this should be within this whatever uh, messages that they sh should exchange, I mean, if the hash does not match, then some the client either either withdraws or or the other server will think that server uh, number one is is not performing correctly right this is this is the message that so it could be either right it could be that the client is cheating the client is trying to frame as you said or it could be that the uh, other server is actually malicious yeah. and in our protocol we don't distinguish between the two cases what we say is that if there's a hash mismatch uh, the client who's uh, who is uh, uh, under attack uh, like who the client uh, who we are talking about should be taken out of the protocol because that client does not want to participate anymore. Rest of the clients still participate. So you don't really abort the protocol. You just take that client out of the protocol. So everything goes on smoothly from there. Great talk. Um, I was wondering whether your uh, protocol can be adapted to more than two parties. Or yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so the thing is, if you go beyond two parties, if you go to like three parties, there are much uh, faster, better ways to solve this problem, especially when you're talking about like honest majority three parties. So uh, our technique loses its competitive advantage uh, if you go to more, more than two, par two parties, yeah. But yeah, it, 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 there's nothing fundamental stopping us from going to more, more parties. It's a great question. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm wondering whether there's a formal definition of what is uh, what does uh, malicious privacy mean? Because in my understanding, in the malicious simulation proof, once it's simulatable, it's both private and secure. Once it is not simulatable, uh, we don't know what happens. So, what does uh, malicious privacy really mean? And is there a formal proof? Uh, excellent question. So in our paper, if you go to the appendix section, you'll find the formal definition. But just to give you a high-level idea, yes, uh, in a malicious security, it should be simulatable and, that, and you have everything. Uh, in a malicious private protocol, uh, the protocol should be simulatable, but the out output of the ideal functionality can be decided by an adversary. That is the only difference. It should still be simulatable. We, uh, and the way that captures malicious privacy is because the output is now controlled by the adversary, so you don't have malicious security, but you still have privacy because it is simulatable. That's a great question. Thanks. I will see you in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the talk. And let's thank the speaker again. And this concludes our session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. <laughs>